All right, and I've I've got the recording started. I got that down. We're we're good to go. And then anybody else who doesn't have a chance to see the whole thing, we can go back and uh, review the tapes. Awesome. So yeah, please <laughs> after you. Well, thank you so much for giving me your time and attention tonight. I am truly honored and very grateful for what you all do to make the Libertarian Party what it is. And this is a huge opportunity that we have. And I'm not going to, you know, blow smoke or uh, just I, I, I want to get you know direct into the point with you as, as delegates going into what we're facing tomorrow. You know, and it is uh, there are a lot of questions about what's going on. What's the process going to be? Is it going to be legally binding? And while my personal preference and how I will vote as a delegate is to vote uh, for a complete uh, in-person convention and that we treat this weekend as a straw poll or a warm up. Uh, something of that nature, or or that we, you know, don't even try to, to have a vote because there's been so much, uh, you know, back and forth and contention and people trying to spoil it. And and I, I don't my that's my position. I am going forward in good faith and participating and lobbying delegates. And my I, I in this sense I will defer to the will of the body. And a lot of people are well. Is it going to be the body? That, that people have faith in even coming together and voting this weekend. So I just want to say it's, it's really, uh, you know, especially an honor to be going into this very difficult, very challenging, very confusing situation with so many beautiful people. And we know that there are people within our ranks who are trying to manipulate us one way or another. And what we are doing in, in more ways than one, I'm seeing really come out of this beautiful you know, community is a lot of people paying attention, a lot of people who care, a lot of people who want to make sure that we put the best face forward for the party, which is in many ways for our movement. And what I think I represent is not just me personally as a messenger. And honestly, I'm okay. Really, we should. I, I'm kind of embarrassed to be the lead fundraiser in this race. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed at this point to be the one with the, with the biggest social media following. And that, that the, se the second to me is, is Vermin Supreme. And you know, that, that we, should, we should expect to be attracting candidates or building and supporting candidates and investing in our bench over the long run and having more people who, who are prominent libertarians and advocates for this message and be supporting each other. And, and it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting uh, journey over this primary so far. But what I have more confidence than ever in is what this platform represents for the party. As a messenger, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I, I have some unique strengths, being a combat veteran, having you know decent name ID still, and better than our field right now, but still really relatively low on the scale. Like what we should expect is more like a John McAfee level of name ID for our nominee. You know, we should at least be have, have a handful of, of high name ID candidates to choose from. I'm kind of, you know, mid-level name ID and, you know, that, 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 that we don't have more. That's kind of disappointing. I don't have the corporate experience, uh, but, you know, I was a sergeant in the Marines. I've, I've worked at a versus the man with my independent media. I've been a successful small business, got my YouTube channel up to uh, over 80 million views. As an author, I've got over a quarter million copies of my book in print. And I'm not ready to sell books, cheesy as it sounds, right, because here it is. And I say that because this book is free. We, we, enough people have read it and they have confidence in this message. They say, I want more people to read this book. And they donate because they want to see it distributed for free. When we tour on this bus, No Force One, we go out and we give away copies of this book for free. It's free in every digital format possible. There's my shameless plug. Uh, but I think what this represents is that I have a proven track record of waking people up, of bringing this message to people outside of the party. And, uh, you know, that's also with my civil disobedience activism, I have a, a unique credibility among different demographics. I've worked with people across the political spectrum on a variety of issues. I did four months in jail for civil disobedience for shotgun, uh, you know, my shotgun activism in, in Washington, D.C. So, you know, it gives me certain credibility on that issue with that crowd. Uh, I got arrested for smoking pot in front of the White House for uh, you know, cursing at cops in, in Middleborough, Massachusetts, when they made that illegal, uh, for, for dancing at the Jefferson Monument in Washington, D.C., right? And, and I think that just shows that I have a track record of doing things that connect with people on real issues. And it's been 
a, a bit of a challenge. I think what a lot of people do, they, you know, they look at me and, and, uh, you know, they say, okay, well, you know, you've done these uh, sort of inflammatory things in the past. What are you presenting now as policy? And what I'm presenting as policy is significantly different. I know this is taking a lot of time, but I see a lot of nodding heads. So I'm, I'm going to keep going. You guys liking me getting kind of deep with this? Okay. So for the model of the, the, you know, people used to think the earth was flat in the center of the universe. Now, and then someone came around and said it's round. Uh, yeah, spheroid. I, I know, I know. Um, but, you know, the, the people who had invested in the old model and made all these fancy equations and justifications for what they were saying, uh, for the, what they were observing, the orbits of, of celestial bodies, you know, then, then, then came along this other model and it was, wow, the math gets really simple. Euclidean geometry, you know, uh, uh, you know, elliptical orbits. Wow, the math gets really simple, right? And it's the same thing with statism versus freedom, right? Government is good and righteous and necessary and police are, are here to protect us and politicians really love us, but occasionally a corrupt one gets through and the corporatocracy is a natural product of, and you just make all these excuses to justify government and then you, then you become a libertarian. You go, no, freedom, no, respect for self-ownership, no, the non-aggression principle, no, liberty, like, yeah, less government, the better, like the, the less coercion in society, the better. The, the, the more freedom, the happier people are. And then here's, so here's the, the libertarian inception, one level deeper in this, okay? I, as a libertarian, used to think we have to argue issue by issue. We have to play politics. We have to be socially liberal and fiscally conservative. We have to play their game. And then I was like, wait a second. No. Localization. This is the embodiment of my favorite quote from Larry Sharp. He says, a libertarian is someone who believes that you can be as liberal or as conservative as you want, as long as you don't force it on anybody. Localization is the cure for polarization. Localization is the ultimate manifestation of our principles. To say we are not going to force our fellow Americans into a centralized system, and it's a better strategy politically. Already, secession polled at over 25% in 2014 before the polarization of Trump and the coronaphobia crisis. People want this. Decentralization is the natural course of human progress politically. As Americans, we can lead the way forward in this. And as libertarians, we can apply our principles to show that we are fundamentally different from the two old parties, the pro-war duopoly. We can unite the people in peace, and this is a central issue to any libertarian who is here for the right reasons, being the anti-war party gives us the chance to unite the American people against the pro-war duopoly. Localization is the only policy that says, we are taking away your toys. We are taking away your tools of evil. We are putting our foot down. We are not gonna put up with this crap anymore. And what this means for the LP, again, I'm not here as some libertarian Jesus, but I do believe I'm a capable messenger with a unique strategy and a unique opportunity. And if we put forth a candidate who can accurately represent this message of localization based on love and respect for our fellow Americans, we can have at very least a breakthrough year for the Libertarian Party in 2020. We should be expecting no less. I think if you nominate someone with this platform, we have the potential to start with up to 25% because that's how popular secession has been historically not even it's, it's it's higher now so this is this is this is what i hope we see as a sharing party i hope to have your faith in in representing our party i hope to have your first ballot votes tomorrow and i'm, I'm happy to answer any and all questions and for those of you who uh, who are delegates on this call or, or part of the party leadership in Delaware. If uh, when, when you're done with the recording, Sean, I'm happy to give my cell phone number to everybody here. I wanna be the most accessible candidate for party activists to support local candidates. Uh, in, in all of the tours we've ever done, we've brought local candidates up on stage and, and shared our platform. My social media platform is available to any local candidates or, or any other party activists. You have content that is appropriate to share with the bigger audience. I want to help you. I want to support you. If I'm the nominee, I'm going to, I'm going to hustle twice as hard as anybody else. And we're going to make sure that we do events every single day that we possibly can. 
and then we bring local candidates up on stage, uh, assuming that, you know, if, if Trump can do it with a mask on, so can the rest of us, right? Wait, no, Trump isn't wearing a mask. He's taking chloroquine. He'll be fine. Thank you. All right. I appreciate your opening statements. And uh, Dale, if you'd like to get us started with our uh, initial round of questions. Uh, sure. Um, oh, sure. So, Adam, we've, we've got um, uh, seven questions we've asked uh, every presidential and vice presidential candidate. Uh, you know, just to be fair, we're going to do the same. Um, and I think you've answered some of those. Uh, we'll just we'll just go through with everything, if, if that's all right. Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so uh, first question is, uh, what is your vision for the country? Yeah, well, I, I guess I should explain then, you know, I'm, I'm technically running for president, but because my platform is based on taking the federal government through a bankruptcy process, uh, where I resign on day one, we declare the federal government as a corporation bankrupt, which we, they, what it really has, is it's kind of acknowledging its state of financial unsustainability as it is the fact that the, the debt that it's taken on is unsustainable so just deciding that as a country that we're declaring bankruptcy we're eliminating this layer of authority of government and we have a peaceful orderly responsible process that leaves us with 50 independent states and up to 562 sovereign native nations as the first step in localization the ultimate goal of which is to get government down to the community level where government is transparent accountable customized and based on your values, set up to meet your needs. And again, you be as liberal, as conservative as you want, right? Instead of libertarians. And by the way, a little sidebar here. The whole anarchist, minarchist divide is nonsense. I used to identify as a minarchist and an anarchist before I realized it was all silly, divisive nonsense. It, 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 I, it, to say that government can't exist or should only do these things are both unlibertarian propositions. I mean, this is I'm risking, at, at risk of of alienating people who identify as either of those things in the audience. I'd like to suggest a different way of looking at this that unifies us as voluntarists, as people who just don't want to force our will on people and say you can have as much or as little government as you want as long as it's voluntary. And the beauty of this is that we stop arguing issues with people when we give them this respect and say, you can have this in your community, I can have this in my community, Liberals and conservatives don't have to meet each other as enemies on the street anymore. It can just be, okay, you live over there. How's that working for you? You live over there. I, I hope that's working well for you. If not, move over here or start a new community or change things in your community because now your voice and your vote are relevant when government is localized. This is the everybody gets what they want strategy. If you're a liberal right now, you live in a liberal state, a conservative in a conservative state, you get rid of the federal government. Right away, both of you get more of what you want and the ultimate goal is to get government down to that level at which it's voluntary where every individual has the choice whether or not to be a part of a system we have a system that respects basic consent because that is really at the core of libertarian ethics right consent we do not endorse any human relationships that are not consensual that are by any kind of coercion that are forced on anybody whether it's this model of government or that model of government doesn't matter and i don't care i'm not a central planner I just care about you having the freedom to pursue what you want in your community as much as possible with all the freedom that you are entitled to as a free, beautiful, independent human being. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our second question is to accomplish in office. I'm sorry, you broke up for a second. Could you repeat that? Sure. I apologize. Um, what is the number one thing you want to accomplish in office? Well, I think I made that pretty clear, too. I don't know. Should we, should yeah. we just see how much time we have left and go to the next one? <laughs> that, that works. Uh, and I, I, I agree. I think I mean, uh, question three, uh, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Well, I think my strengths are my commitment to principle, my policy that is the manifestation of that, my ability to communicate that, and my personal credibility to back it up. I think that makes me a unique package of strengths as a candidate. I will admit I have two major weaknesses and one is relatively low name ID. And I mean that in the general public sense. And in that sense, this is a strength in the primary because no one else running right now uh, that can match me for name ID, except maybe Vermin Supreme. And I would, I would argue with him on that if you really want to throw down. But um, 
then uh, the other weakness is lack of executive experience. And, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, and it's just when, like when Ron Paul was running and uh, I was organizing veterans for Ron Paul, it was an amazing experience. Uh, people were putting together their fantasy cabinet and they put, uh, they put me as secretary of defense. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I was a sergeant. You, you, you want me to be the Secretary of Defense under a constitutional Ron Paul government? That is not in line with reality. But, you know, as a proposition to the Libertarian Party to put me forth as a proposition to the American public to say, look, we don't have to have a president. You know, the authority of the presidency is, is a lot. The authority that, that Adam would be taking on here is, you know, a tiny, tiny portion of that to go in with the authority of the American people to say, no, nah, I mean, we're, we're not doing this federal government thing anymore. And by the way, this is a, a sadly moderate platform. Most people don't realize this. Uh, do you know? I mean, I, I don't know if I should put anybody on the spot right now, but I love asking people, do you know how many people work for the government in the United States at all three levels, state, federal, and local? And most people have, like, no idea. It's a wild guess. And libertarians are usually in, in the ballpark. The answer is 22 million. Now, here's the important follow-up question. How many work for the federal government? It's only three out of those 22 million. I am proposing we cut less than one in seven government jobs. And you go, well, gee, anybody advocating for anything less than that kind of is advocating for the status quo. And it's, it's really embarrassingly modern in that sense as a platform because a lot of those jobs can get absorbed by states in the localization process. But anyway, it's a little off topic. But being able to, to hold the line on this as someone who has, has proven in my character, in my stance against authority, in the way I've conducted myself as a civil disobedience, the way I've gone into legal situations. I just beat four felonies and a misdemeanor drug charges in Texas over the course of a two-year legal battle because I had the patience to apply the religious freedom argument, and I won. I turned four felonies and a misdemeanor down into a $180 fine. So, uh, you know, this is, this is you know, stuff I, I want to be able to share with people. I want to bring to a bigger audience. And I think I, I'm uniquely qualified with my personal history as an activist to carry our message as libertarians with credibility. Okay, awesome, cool, thank you. Um, if you don't win, how do you see yourself involved with the LP? Oh, I'm going to keep doing this uh, one way or another. I, I love, the, I love, um, I mean, I love the Libertarian Party. I've been a lifetime member since 2004 when I got back from Iraq. It was the first time I could afford it. And it was only $1,000 back then. Tough luck for y'all. Now it's 1500 bucks. Yeah, that's inflation for you. Um, and I, I, I love this party. I organized uh, a college libertarian affiliate when I was at Claremont in, in Southern California. Um, I stood up a county affiliate here in Yavapai, Arizona. I've run for Senate as a libertarian. And I love being able to use this national platform to take my message that I care about, which I think is our message from the statement of principles and share it with a broader audience. And that's been the best part of this campaign so far, aside from going to state conventions and hanging out with libertarians is talking to hosts in front of audiences with a different message. So uh, my commitment to my supporters, excuse me, is that uh, I will keep running on this platform as long as support keeps building and the federal government keeps existing. And the support has only grown for this campaign and, and just gotten, you know, I, just, I knew we needed a long running head start to even be a contender. It's very exciting to see, you know, what's happening this weekend, you know, being excluded from the debate, but being, uh, you know, everybody's second choice and still people going, oh, crap, he didn't get in the debate. Well, we got to we got to make sure he gets his first. We get we get him our first ballot votes. Now, you know, if the, the process tomorrow is going to be credible or transparent or if we go forward to July. But I, I love being a libertarian candidate. I love being a libertarian party organizer. I love being around libertarians who uh, ag agree with me that politics is a, a critical way to advance our message, which really does transcend politics. All right. Uh, just three more questions to go, and we've got about five more minutes. So. All right. Thank you for that heads up. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, follow up to the above. Uh, is there any candidate that you won't support if they win the nomination? 
Um, I mean, uh, uh, certainly of those on the stage for the Bane debate tonight, no, I'd be happy to support any of them. Um, there, I, I don't. There's there are others that, that are not running serious campaigns. I wouldn't be able to in a blanket statement say all. Um, and there, you know, I'd have various degrees of enthusiasm, but at very least, yeah, I would be absolutely happy to endorse and, and actively support any of the candidates on the main stage tonight. Okay, great, thank you. Um, number six, uh, is there anything in your past or present that could come back to haunt you? Yeah, well, the worst thing is something that I've really owned in the most powerful way possible. And it's that when I was in the Marine Corps, I volunteered to go to Fallujah in 2004. I volunteered with the best of intentions. I went civil affairs. I taught myself Arabic to be better at my job. I was against the invasion, but I was for the occupation in the sense that I thought we were cleaning up our mess and doing responsible foreign policy. But then one night during the siege of Fallujah, you know, I was there for a few weeks of combat or my combat action ribbon. But one night when we had the city under siege, I was asked to guard uh, a couple of detainees who were just trying to get out of the city as far as we know. And they were sandbagged, sandbags over their heads, hands zip tied behind their backs, forced to sit cross-legged on a cement floor and not allowed to get up, not allowed to go to the bathroom, not allowed to drink water, not allowed to fall, to, to not off or fall asleep or anything like that. And I was asked to guard them and, and to continue that sleep deprivation torture. And it was torture. And I should have disobeyed those illegal orders and instead I use my Arabic to taunt them. And it is something that still haunts me to this day, but I think it, I, I've turned it into the greatest strength possible in the foundation of why we must, uh, as a society, as, as a global human family, oppose militarism. And, and militarism is a cancer on the warrior class. A warrior is someone who's gonna put their life on the line to do the right thing. And a, and a soldier, is someone who signs up to kill for politicians. That's the difference. It, it is, we, we are on the verge of, you know, a, a major evolutionary shift. And for the warrior class, and, and that includes every libertarian, everybody who's willing to put on the L and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to stand apart from the military industrial complex. I mean, you guys are warriors in the same sense. I say, you know, we, we are overrepresented as veterans in the libertarian community. You know, at events, I'll, I'll say, you know, raise your hand or stand, you know, I'll say, raise your hand if you're a veteran. Don't worry, I won't make you stand up and blow smoke up your butts. But thank you for continuing the spirit of your service by being a part of the libertarian party and for everybody else joining us. Because what we are doing is putting our lives on the line for, to, to, to fight injustice. I mean, make no doubt about it. Governments are the greatest sources of injustice in the world today. They can pervert the greatest in intentions of, of good people to, to commit the greatest atrocities. And, and I want my story to be a testament to that so that we can you know, just absolutely confront militarism without apology and unite the American people against the, the pro-war parties. Awesome. Thank you. And our last question, uh, and we've got about a minute left, is, uh, is taxation theft. Taxation is theft, absolutely. The Dalai Lama was once asked, what's the first thing you would do if you were president? And he said, I would start calling things by their proper names. War is murder. Politicians are criminals. Government is a racket. And of course, taxation is theft. And just being absolutely honest and unabashed about what it means to be a libertarian, standing on principle and intellectual integrity and, and not, not being afraid to know what the truth is and stand firm on the truth. That's what really sets us apart as libertarians. I hope to have the honor of your support tomorrow uh, or whatever is left in this nominating process. Sean, Dale, please, thank you so much. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, you know, please share our, our websites with this video wherever you post it. And I appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Again, uh, as soon as we stop with the recording, I'm happy to give everybody my cell phone number and you know, share that with any delegates or anybody who you think should have it. This is a really exciting time for the Libertarian Party, a historical moment, and it's an honor to share with all of you. All right, Mr. Kokesh. And if it's all right with you, uh, I do have your, uh, your number and I can give that to other, uh, other delegates who, who uh, would like to All right, to we'll, just, we'll just do it that way then. If anybody needs it, just send Sean a message or in the chat. Perfect. All right, I want to thank you for taking time out of your evening to come speak with us, and uh, best of luck to you and your campaign and the uh, broader campaign of your freedom movement. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. Thank you, Adam, and I have your book. 
I came and saw you six awesome. months, two years ago up in Wilmington. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate Take that. Take care. And please, Bye -bye. please come back to Delaware and uh, sometime. We'd love to have you. Just let us know. Oh, well, about thank that you. ongoing commitment, we're going to be doing a national tour at least once a year. So be following me, be in touch. We'll make another Delaware event happen. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Adam. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye.